we're go. So critical access, you can do it. Why emergency medicine exists. There is a, a tradition or a belief in emergency medicine that if you're not at a big trauma center taking care of gunshot wounds and trauma after trauma, critical patient after critical patient, then you're not really practicing emergency medicine. And I would argue the opposite. I would argue that the real cowboys are those people in the field bringing quality care to the communities that are remote and that really need it. I have no disclosures. This is Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, North Idaho, where I live. So we're going to start with a case study. Um, at 2247, a 69-year-old man presents to a critical access emergency department. He's got a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, GERD, and atrial fibrillation. His chief complaint is right-sided jaw pain. This started suddenly after dinner and was rapidly progressing throughout the evening. So he came into the ER at night. Focused review systems. He's got no cough, no fever, no difficulty in breathing, chest pain, or nausea. He has no toothache or sore throat. He does have a headache. Uh, significant past surgical history. He had all his teeth extracted at 18 and a full set of dentures. So we're not terribly worried about oral issues. Medications include levothyroxine, ranitidine, uloric, amlodipine, gabapentin, lisinopril, metoprolol, and prodexa. Physical exam. Little hypertensive, little tachycardic. He was alert and no acute distress, no strider or posturing. Uh, the only thing significant on ENT was that his neck felt a little bit boggy, and it was hard to describe other than that. It just felt a little boggy. The rest of his exam was normal. Um, we did a point of care ultrasound of the soft tissues of the neck and all we could see was a little interstitial fluid. There was no mass, no obvious fluid collection, no pulsatile mass. So what's going on? I have no idea. Decided to shotgun it. So routine labs and a CAT scan of the neck was ordered. In the meantime, a cardiac arrest presented to the emergency department and at our hospital that means everybody leaves and takes care of the cardiac arrest. Uh, about an hour later, after the code was completed, the patient was re-examined. Now he's got increased pain and more obvious neck swelling. He's got a slight laryngospastic cough and is developing a hot potato voice. He has recently come back from CT that we now have a chance to look at. CT was reviewed and we discussed it with the NT over the phone. So what have we got? We've got general soft tissue swelling and you can see behind the tongue, it's compromising the airway. It's starting to compromise the airway, okay? This is what John cut back for me a little bit so we no longer have the date and time. So he's got trismus now, more pain and swelling, and we're seeing asymmetric edema in the oropharynx now on the right side of the soft palate. What is it? Angioedema, okay? We've got angioedema at a critical access hospital. Very atypical in presentation, but this is angioedema. So we need to get this guy intubated and transferred. We can see that his airway is starting to close off. Routine meds were given to treat him and he was moved into a larger room for access. Discussed with ENT about how to proceed, and ENT started telling me, well, can you get your general surgeon in? How about getting anesthesia in there? Do you have an esthetist out there? And he kept on running through lists, and I stopped him. Stop. Stop. It's just me. Or is it just me? You, you need to be a little creative. So first of all, let's talk about where we are, okay? This is the United States. This is for the Croatia, obviously, if we're in Arizona. I don't need to tell them it's the United States. Very big country. We're 3,000 miles wide, 5,000 kilometers. This is Idaho. This is where we are, and we are actually in the very northern part called the Panhandle. This is Iowa, which I like to call not Idaho. About half the people I know back east actually think I'm in Iowa. I'm in Idaho. It's 1,300 miles west of Iowa. So. <coughs> Idaho's in the Pacific Northwest. It's a really fun place. We have Boeing, Pearl Jam, Starbucks, Microsoft, 
every kind of wild animal you can imagine. Huckleberries, Iowa, that's about all that's there as far as I know. But one thing that we both have in common, being states with large rural areas, is a, a, a large amount of our population is served by small and critical access hospitals. Really, is that really common? So what is a critical access hospital? CMS defines critical access, uh, in essence, as being in a rural area. You have to provide 24-7 emergency services. There have to be 25 or less inpatient beds. That's at maximum capacity. That is not average stay. That is maximum capacity, 25 or less. You need an annual average length of stay of 96 hours or less per patient for an acute care stay. And you have to be located more than a 35 mile drive from any hospital or other critical access facility. They're all over the place. A huge amount of the country is served by critical access hospitals. And this doesn't even count the small hospitals with limited resources that have very similar backup. There are over 1,300 critical access hospitals located throughout the United States. Back to our case report, management of angioedema. Uh, so we all know in a tertiary hospital, we all learn this in training, what do you do? You get ENT, you get your most experienced anesthesiologist, you go to the operating room to intubate and have ENT back up to get ready for doing an emergent trach. Critical access hospital management, it's just you. Or is it? So this is Bill. Bill has airway training. He is our EMS medical director, and he is the only paramedic in the entire county, in the entire 40-mile uh, Silver Valley area in which I work. He is my airway backup. So the, the first thing you need to do in a critical access hospital is think outside the box. If you want airway backup, it doesn't have to be an anesthetist, an anesthesiologist, um, an ENT. Your paramedic can help you. You have to think a little differently than you were trained. When resources are limited, be creative. Paramedic and respiratory therapy can back up an airway. Radiology techs can start IVs and help with your bagging a patient. Housekeeping can do compressions. If you need hands and a warm body, housekeeping is hands and a warm body, freeing up your clinical people to give medicines or do any of the more advanced things that you need done. Students of any kind, whether they're nursing, EMT, radiology students are eager to help with anything. There isn't an EMT student in the world that won't jump in and do anything you tell them to. If EMS brings a crashing or coding patient, keep them there. You have got three warm bodies and six hands to help you out with whatever you need. EMS can also help with interosseous lines. So this is Anne. This is my respiratory therapy department at my critical access hospital. We have one respiratory therapist, although she unofficially will come in anytime you ask. She does not formally take call and she's pretty much available during banker's hours. So rule number two, you really need to know your resources. When you live in a, in a remote or rural area, you need to know what's around in facilities so that you're sending somebody to the correct direction. So we know at my facility, it takes a minimum for 45 minutes for a helicopter to reach my shop, and I'll explain why. ALS ground can be there in 20 minutes and have them to the hospital about 45 minutes later. So by the time your helicopter would arrive, you could have them almost at the door of this uh, next county hospital. Most of the time it's faster to get them by ground unless that out of hospital time really needs to be shortened in your super critical patients. So we, we really reserve air ambulance for those that need to minimize that out of hospital time. Um, for some of the farther locations, we actually go past what a helicopter range is, what the rotary ring is, and we have to do fixed wing. And then getting rendezvous with a fixed wing because they can't fly into the Silver Valley because of the air currents makes it more complicated. I'm at 10 minutes. Different locations have different considerations, for example, where a NICU is and that sort of thing. So 
Here is a close-up of that little panhandle of North Idaho. So Coeur d'Alene is where I live. This is where the main community hospital it has the nearest cath lab and so on. I practice actually out in Kellogg, which is about 40 miles away. The nearest helicopter is Sandpoint. So by ground, that's an hour and a half away. Um, but between the time it takes the helicopter crew to get there and the flight time, it's 45 minutes for a helicopter to get here. So this is where I do cath lab, my, most of my trauma. This is a level two trauma center here in Spokane. Um, this is also where complicated joints would go. I think I have another slide. Um, if I get to a, a level one trauma center or a burn, that has to go all the way to Seattle. So as I showed you on the map, the community hospital that had all adult services, a level three trauma, ortho, cath lab, Neurologist, but not a designated stroke center. NICU, but no PICU. Spokane, a little farther. Level two trauma center. You can do your more complicated joints. There's a children's hospital there, a Shriners hospital, and they do stroke center and endovascular. There's four hospitals in the Spokane area. But if you want to get to a level one, you actually have to go all the way to Seattle. So by ground, that's about five, five six hours from my facility. It's too far for a rotary wing. That's when you have to get into your fixed wing transport. It's about um, 350 miles away. So start the transfer process early. It takes 20 minutes for ALS to get there. It takes 45 minutes for the helicopter. Almost as soon as you go in the room, you or somebody needs to get on the phone and start getting those people in so you can get them out of there for definitive care. Um, it can take hours to get a bed at some of these facilities and sometimes you, if you can't find a bed east then you have to start looking an hour and a half or more away west. You may have to call more than five hospitals in a busy, busy season to find especially a critical care bed during flu season, a trauma bed during trauma season, that sort of thing. You often have to give the same story to multiple specialists. So as soon as you have enough information to make a disposition, start that process. Do not delay. You will become very familiar with this in a critical access hospital. You don't have a huck. I don't have a huck in my emergency department. There's one during banker's hours in the lobby. There is never a huck. And if you have your nurses giving meds, doing lines, your other, uh, your CNA is doing paperwork, you're the least valuable member of the team. You're the one on the phone. So expect that. Early intervention, every intervention can delay definitive care. So. Every drip that you start, you start a chest pain on a nitro drip, you've got to start the drip, you've got one nurse that can only do one medicine at a time, and then it's going to take time for them to transfer it to their uh, equipment for transfer. So you may want to consider nitro paste instead of a drip, push dose pressors instead of drips. Foley, NG tube, they all take time. Don't delay your transfer for this. If radiology is not in-house, sometimes you send trauma patients before imaging. Rule number five, do not be proud. Backup is backup. If respiratory and paramedics don't have your training, you don't have theirs. Be grateful for any help you can get. Going back to our case study, we planned for emergent intubation and he was also consented for a crike. I called a paramedic in. Uh, what we did was we actually prepped and draped the neck, went over, opened the kit, made sure we were both comfortable with the crike kit as I got ready to intubate him. Fortunately, the patient was easily intubated and transfer was arranged. He was in the ICU for two days, was weaned from the vent, and after his ACE inhibitors wore off, was discharged home uneventfully. No problems. So in summary, you did not train for this. You trained at an academic institution with backup, but you have the skills to do this job. You need to think outside the box, know your resources, start the transfer process early, limit procedures or meds that could delay definitive care, do not be proud, accept any help you can get. Remember that hospitals have limited resources and we are trained in initial evaluation and stabilization of any disease and then can transfer them to the appropriate facility. If you don't do it, who is there? Small towns everywhere deserve quality care, and we have the training to provide it. Thank you. I want to put my blog up here, yeah. and that was what I tried to do on my phone, which was so an obvious said, fail. So you said it's just you, but like, how many nurses do you have? Right. So I have, at my facility, I have one RN and a CNA, and that is my entire staff in the emergency department. Very good.